Şimdi dedim. Şu an bak kırmızı yandı sol tarafta. Senin senin de yandı mı? Kırmızı olarak görüyor musun? Evet, evet live olarak görüyorum. Tamam. Ee, tamam. Şey tarafı yok sadece. Evet. Orada da gördüm. Tamam. Canlıya geçtik. Ee, birazcık azıcık daha bekleyelim. Bu e, tam tam saatinde başlamak önemli oluyor ya bu tarz etkinliklerde. Ee, o yüzden bu şey gibi stüdyo ortamı e, internet üzerinden stüdyo ortamı gibi kendimi böyle işte hem yönetmen hem kameraman hem <gülüyor> şefi gibi hissediyorum. Böyle ilginç bir durum. Medya evet. sektörüne gördük. <gülüyor> Aynen öyle. Dijital medya sektörü. Evet. Başlayalım. Herkese merhaba. Bu İzmir Demokrasi Üniversitesi Yapay Zeka ve Veri Analitiği Uygulama Araştırma Merkezi'nin, Uygar Merkezimizin e, seminer serisinin ikinci e, semineri. E, yayınımızda bu sefer e, çok sevdiğim bir arkadaşım e, Ertunç var, Ertunç Erdil var. E, kendisi İsviçre'den bağlanıyor. E, bize e, yapay zeka, veri analitiği, veri bilimi, makine öğrenmesi, e, derin öğrenme konularında e, şeylerini, deneyimlerini paylaşacak. Ee, hoş geldin Ertunç. Merhaba. Hoş bulduk. Merhaba. Teşekkürler davet için. <gülüyor> çok memnun oldum valla. Ee, böyle şey tanıdık yüzler görmek çok güzel. Ee, pandemi döneminde <gülüyor> birbirimize hasret kaldık aslında. Ee, neyse bu, bu dijital Kesinlikle. platformlarda da bu hasreti evet. gidermeye çalışıyoruz. Ee, şimdi bu, bugün... E, ben bir kısaca seni tanıtayım. Ondan sonra çok da vakit kaybetmeden Hı-hı. istersen e, mikrofonu sana vereyim. Ee, tamam, süper. Bu dediğim gibi e, şeyin e, Uyber Merkezimizin ikinci seminer e, semineri. E, seminer serisinin Hı-hı. ikinci semineri. E, bir önceki konuşmada ses e, analizi, ses işleme ile ilgili bir e, konuşmamız olmuştu. Bu sefer de görüntü işleme ile ilgili bir e, konuşma olacak. E, Doktor Ertunç Erdil'i size takdim etmek isterim. Ertunç Erdil şu an e, ETH Zürich'te e, dünyanın en e, prestijli üniversitelerinden bir tanesinde e, çalışmakta. E, Ertunç'u kısaca tanıtacak olursam ben aslında e, geçmişi Sabancı Üniversitesi'nde doktora. E, Sabancı Üniversitesi'nde 2017 yılında e, bilgisayar bilimleri e, alanında diyelim ya da bölümünde e, doktorasını e, tamamladı. E, o zaman birlikte de çalıştık biz. E, aynı projede de çalıştık. E, belki daha sonra e, bu konuşmada olmayacak ama belki daha sonrasında e, o projede neler yaptığımızla ilgili de e, Ertan'ı davet edebiliriz. Çok da güzel olabilir. E, 2017'de Sabancı Üniversitesi'nde doktorayı tamamladıktan sonra gayet de başarılı bir şekilde, çok da başarılı e, bir çalışmaydı bence. Hem e, bu arada izleyenlere söylemek isterim. Ertuğrul'un hem doktora çalışması hem de master çalışması aslında, master tezi de oldukça e, meyvesi bol e, çalışmalardı şey anlamında. E, İngilizceden Türkçe'ye direkt çevirdim. Yayın anlamında e, kendisini takip etmenizi tavsiye ederim. Eğer görüntü işlemeyle ilgili e, çalışmak istiyorsanız, kimin ne yaptığını öğrenmek istiyorsanız. E, 2017'de Sabancı'da doktora eğitim almadıktan sonra Ertuğrul'un İngiltere'ye geçti. Bildiğim kadarıyla ARM şirketine e, geçti. Değil mi Ertuğrul? Ee, evet, evet. Heh, orada e, araştırma mühendisi olarak bayağı ciddi e, bayağı ciddi çalışmalar yaptın. Gene şeyde bilgisayarla görü, computer vision alanında aslında e, çalışıyordun bildiğim Hı-hı. kadarıyla. E, sonrasında 2019'da evet, evet. bu sefer İngiltere'den İsviçre'ye e, bir geçiş oldu. Ee, İsviçre'de ETH Zürich, Zürich'teki önemli iki e, üniversiteden bir tanesi e, ETH. E, 
Dünya plasmanında da bayağı te, e, üst sıralardadır. Orada Computer Vision Laboratuvarı'nda sanırım Ender Konuk olduğu ile birlikte, e, birliktesin şu anda. Orada evet, e, doktorası araştırmacı e, e, şeklinde e, çalışıyorsun. Ve gene görüntü işleme, e, makine öğrenmesi, derin öğrenme bunların medikal alana uygulanması gibi alanlarda çalışıyorsun anladığım kadarıyla. E, bugün de bize şeyi, e, Contrastive Learning of Global and Local Features for Medical Image Segmentation with Limited Annotations başlıklı bir e, seminer vereceksin. Se- seminerin başlığını İngilizce e, paylaştım, söyledim. Çünkü e, semineri İngilizce yapmayı e, yapmayı tercih ettim. E, dinleyenler, e, uluslararası seminerleri dinleyenler olacak diye. Şey konusunda ama e, dinleyenlere şey söylemek isterim. Yine e, sorularınız olursa e, chatten yazabilirsiniz. E, şey tarafını e, sunum bittikten sonra e, seminer bittik yani evet sunum bittikten sonra soru cevap kısmını Türkçe de yapabiliriz. Türkçe İngilizce karışık da yapabiliriz. Ama seminer bittikten sonra evet. sorular sorulacak. E, dolayısıyla e, sorularınızı da bekliyoruz. Ertunç hoş geldin tekrar. E, biraz fazla uzattım. E, ben Sözü sana verebilirim artık. E, i̇stersen... Tamam, süper, çok yani teşekkürler. Ben, ben birazcık seni tanıtmaya çalıştım ama elimden geldiğince istersen kısaca kendinden bahsedersin. Ondan sonra da e, şeyi e, sunumuna geçersin. Ben şimdi şeyini de desktop'unu da ekledim e, yayına. E, söz sende. Çok teşekkürler tanıtım için ve davet için de teşekkürler ayrıca. Ee, Devrim'in bahsettiği gibi sunum İngilizce olacak. So, o yüzden İngilizceye döneyim ben. Okay. Uh, hello everyone. Thanks for joining today and having me here today. This is Ertunç. Uh, I'm working as a postdoctoral researcher here in the Computer Vision Laboratory in ETH Zurich. Title of today's talk is Contrastive Learning of Global and Local Features uh, for Medical Image Segmentation with Limited Annotations. So before I start presenting the work, I'd like to introduce myself very briefly. As Devrim mentioned, I obtained my PhD in 2017 in Sabancı University, uh, where my focus was developing on Bayesian methods for image segmentation. Then I moved to an industrial research position and worked at ARM for two years. There I was working on developing hardware image processing methods, basically, because ARM basically is a hardware company. Uh, then I switched back to academic research and started working as a postdoctoral researcher in the computer vision laboratory in ETH3 since almost like two years. Here, my main research focus is developing annotation efficient and trustworthy machine learning methods, mostly with applications to medical image analysis. So today I'm going the work titled, I mean, as you see here, The work I'm going to present was presented as an oral talk, talk in NORIPS conference in 2020, as most of you probably know about NORIPS, which is one of the most prestigious conferences in the field. So again, before I start, I should acknowledge people who contributed to, contributed to this work. Krishna is the person who led the work as a part of his PhD thesis. He also has quite interesting contributions to the semi-supervised learning literature when learning from like a limited annotated data sets, et cetera. And Nira Karani and, and Daikon Nicola are the other co-authors as me. Finally, I also acknowledge our funding resources. So let me give the outline of the talk. I will first motivate the problem that we are aiming to solve. Then I will go through some of the existing methods in the literature that are focusing on training neural networks with limited annotation. In this paper, we basically have two main contributions. Uh, one is a global and the other is a local pre-training strategies for neural networks using contrastive learning. Next, I will present these proposed strategies and I will finish the talk with some experimental results and conclusion. So uh, there is a huge and still growing interest for developing deep neural networks in many applications. Every day, like we have been hearing a lot about the success of deep learning based methods in many interesting applications ranging from 
healthcare to autonomous vehicles. So for those who are not familiar with the neural network, let me quickly recap the role of deep neural networks, in, in particular convolutional uh, neural networks for image analysis. So a convolutional neural network, CNN in short, is an architecture that contains stacked together, uh, that, that contains various layers that are stacked together and forms an architecture shown as shown in the figures. And these layers may include convolutional layer, max pooling layers, some normalization layers, and some nonlinearity layers, such as real. And some of these layers have parameters to be learned. So let us denote these parameters by theta. Then the neural network becomes a function parameterized by theta that takes an image x as the input and predicts a segmentation mask y hat. So we learn the par uh, parameters theta by minimizing a loss function between the predictions y hat and the ground truth segmentations y using an algorithm called backpropagations and using a like set of label training images, basically. After training this model, we get an estimate of the neural network parameters, which we denote as theta hat. And once we learn these parameters, we use the function f parameterized by theta to make predictions on test images. And Neural networks are indeed quite successful in test time. However, there is a strong requirement that needs to be met for neural networks to work quite well. Uh, the requirement is that the training set should be sufficiently large to capture the variations of the test distributions. But this requirement like, usually requires a large amount of labeled training sets. If this requirement is not met, the accuracy of the networks drops significantly. So basically, they become not as useful as they are before when they are trained like a bit lots of labeled data. And the problem here is that obtaining very large manual labeled data sets are not quite easy because manual labeling process comes with a cost. And this cost, especially significantly higher in some applications. And medical image segmentation is one of such applications. This is mainly because medical images needs to be annotated by domain experts, such as radiologists, and most of which are already overloaded by their workload. So we cannot basically ask them to annotate too many images. And to make things even more complicated, medical images are 3D, and the manual annotation needs to be done in every single slice of the, uh, of the images. So annotating even a single 3D volume takes about hours. And when we consider repeating this annotation process for the images from every clinic, every scanner type, and even every scanner parameter, this become not feasible because basically a network trained on labeled images from a particular scanner does not generalize to or does not work well to images from other scanners. So we basically need annotated data images or data sets for the images from every clinic, every scanner, etc. So to sum up, obtaining expert labels are quite expensive and labeling every single images is not a like a feasible solution. The question is how can we deal with this problem? So we might be lacking manually annotated, annotated images. But on the other hand, we usually have unlabeled images that we can exploit. So our goal in this work is to achieve high segmentation performance with limited annotations while leveraging unlabeled data. Because unlabeled data, in unlabeled data, we basically, doesn't have, we basically don't have this annotation cost. So there are previous attempts in the literature to deal with the setting where we have access to only a limited annotated data. We can group the existing works into three. The first one is data augmentation, which aims populating the limited label data set uh, by applying different random, random transformations or by using generative models. The second uh, family is called as 
like semi-supervised learning. One well-known approach in this category is called uh, self-training, which I will go into a bit more details soon. And the last category is called a self-supervised learning. And the work I'm going to present, our work that I'm going to present, falls into this category, this last category. Let me go into a bit more in details of these approaches. So one conventional way of performing data augmentation is applying random affine transformations, such as cropping, rotation, flipping, and scaling. So we can also apply other random transformations, such as elastic deformations intense transform and intense transformations uh, to change the contrast and the brightness. In this way, we can populate our limited training data set and train a neural network by using this populated data set with like more labels. So in a more recent method, which we call as mixup, mixup is a more recent like data augmentation method. It's quite simple, but it still yields good improvements. The idea behind mixup is to blend different labeled images and the corresponding labels with some ratios. For example, here uh, we have a cat and a bird images. These images are labeled with probability of one for corresponding classes. Uh, we linearly combine these images by weighting the cat image with 0 0.7 and the bird image with 0 0.3. So the label probabilities of the resulting images is assigned based on the weights, that is, the resulting image is a cat with probability of 0 0.7 and a bird with probability of 0 0.3. There are also more advanced method, data augmentation methods proposed in the literature, and one of which is proposed in our group. Uh, in the pre previous data augmentation methods, we generate some augmented data, but we don't know if the generated data will be useful for a downstream task or not. I mean, and this downstream task, like, can be segmentation tasks. We just hope that the augmented data sets will be useful for a particular test, but there is no guarantee. In, uh, in these type of works, the augmented, I mean, in the type of work that I'm going to present now, these are, uh, the augmented images are generated such that uh, they are useful for a downstream test. Therefore, these approaches are called as test-driven data augmentation methods. In this particular approach, we aim generating augmented images that are useful for segmentation tests by using limited labeled data and leveraging the unlabeled data. Here, we have a generating network that takes the labeled image XL and a random vector Z as input, and the generated network outputs a 2D vector of the formation field, then the input image XL is warped using this deformation. The deformed image XG is given to a discriminator network as input, along with the other labeled and non-labeled images we have. And the discriminator is trained to distinguish the real images from the generated ones in an adversarial fashion. After this adversarial training, the generator learns to output the formation fields uh, that leads to realistic images after deformation. And additionally, here we also have a segmentation network that is trained on the data set with limited labels. So after joint training of this architecture with the adversarial laws and the segmentation laws, the generator network learns to output the formation fields that leads to realistic images after deformation as well as uh, such that these images, the augmented images, will be useful for the downstream task, which is segmentation in this case. So, so the other group of methods are called as semi-supervised learning. Self-training is one of the well-known methods in this category. In self-training, first we train a neural network using a data set with limited labels. Then, Relying on the trained networks on the limited labels, uh, we obtain the labels on, of the unlabeled images by single forward pass of the images uh, through this network. 
And we call these images, these labels as pseudo labels. And again, by relying on these pseudo labels, we retrain the whole network in a supervised fashion using the labeled data set and the unlabeled data set with pseudo labels. And the last category is called as self-supervised learning. Uh, in self-supervised learning based methods, a part of the network is trained on unlabeled images using a self-supervised task. Then more layers are added on top of this pre-trained network and the whole architecture is fine-tuned using the training set with limited table. Here, the assumption is that uh, the representations learned by the self-supervised self task uh, will be useful for the downstream task, uh, and which enables training the remaining part of the network with limited labels. Here, there are two categories of self-supervised methods that are relevant to this work. One is the pretext task, based methods and the other one is the contrastive loss based methods so here <clears throat> i present two examples of the pretext task based methods the first task is rotation where an input image is rotated to a certain degree and the network is trained to predict the uh, rotation angle here, since we control the rotation angles, we know that the values that we are going to predict, which makes the task self-supervised. I mean, this doesn't require any additional manual labeling process. That's why these family of methods are called self-supervised. So another pretext task is in painting, where we randomly crop a region from an, from an image and aim to predict the crop region. And similar to rotation, this task is also self-supervised. Since we know the region that we are going to predict, and this also does not require uh, additional annotation. Once the network is trained using a particular self-supervised task, a lower, lower dimensional representation from the networks uh, is used to train a smaller network for a downstream task with limited levels. And another category of of self-supervised learning methods are based on contrastive learning that have yielded state-of-the-art results in recent works. One of the algorithms, I mean, very recent algorithms, is called a SimCLR. The intuition of this approach is that different transformations of an image should have similar representations in the latent space. And simultaneously, these representations should be dissimilar to the remaining images. In this algorithm, we basically sample two random transformations, t hat and t tilde, and apply on an image x to get x hat and x tilde. These two images form the positive pair set, as shown with two crop versions of a dog image. And each crop dog image constructs a negative pair with the remaining images in the batch uh, denoted by x bar. Again, the intuition is that different crop of the crop versions of the dog image should be similar in the latent space and they should be dissimilar from the remaining images. Then a neural network is trained using the contrastive loss by randomly choosing different negative and positive sets in each batch. In each batch. During optimization, we enforce that the latent representations of positive pairs denoted by z hat and z tilde to be similar to each other, as shown by the like the green dots here, and to be dissimilar to the remaining latent representations. Note that this type of training does not require additional labeling. We just use the similarity information uh, of the contrasting pairs. And once the model is trained, the representation after the encoder is used to train some new additional layers uh, with some new additional layers for the downstream task uh, with limited labels. So let me give the mathematical formulation for the uh, global contrastive loss. This is the loss for a given positive pair. Here, lambda plus and lambda minus represents the positive and negative pair sets, like respectively. 
Sim is the cosine similarity between latent representations. Tau is a hyperparameter called temperature scaling. And note that this loss is minimized when the numerator, I mean, the similarity between the positive pairs is maximum, and the similarity between the negative pairs is minimum, just like we aim. And the total loss of the batch is defined as summation over all uh, positive pairs. But there is a downside of SimCLR algorithm and that we need to be careful when choosing positive and negative pairs. Here we don't have any label information and we have like the dog image for uh, when choosing the positive pairs. And there, but the problem is the remaining images, image set, X bar, may contain a dog image as well. And we might be enforcing them to be dissimilar during training. This is not a correct similarity queue and some like and can cause some degradation in performance because basically we, what we expect is to get similar representations for two different dog images as well, right? But we don't have this label information. And this is one of the problems that we are aiming to solve in the proposed method. So the SimCLR idea, the contrastive learning idea that I presented, uh, can be directly applied on medical images. This direct application would rely on random transformations. And we denote this strategy with G superscript of R, which stands for global loss with random transformation. I will use I will use this notation for of G superscript R in our experiments when comparing R method with this direct extension. In this direct extension, uh, in a given batch, we apply two random transformations uh, on each image. Then the transformed images form the positive pair set, and the rest of the images in the in the batch would form uh, negative pairs. So our first contribution is a global training strategy using contrastive loss for medical images. So here we hypothesize, hypothesize that the choice of positive and negative pairs can be crucial to learning good global representations. And our contribution is to, is to incorporate domain knowledge uh, when defining these pairs. Medical images are treated. And we, and we know that they are roughly aligned, meaning that same slices across different patients correspond to a similar anatomical reach. For example, in these figures, for a cardiac MRI dataset, we show corresponding slices side by side for uh, two different subjects. Here we can observe that the structures are similar across subjects with, sim with variability in anatomical shape and intensity characteristic. And we exploit this in formation when sampling uh, positive and negative images during training. And we achieve this by pre-training an encoder uh, to capture the global features. So <clears throat> with this motivation, we partition the volumes and show that corresponding slices across subjects contain similar global information. Here we see that similar slices across subjects are similar to each other, and they are dissimilar to the slices in different partitions. So we propose here two global contrasting strategies uh, to choose positive and negative pairs to leverage the similarity. We denote the first strategy as G superscript of D minus, where we carefully select the negative pairs for global features. And here D denotes using domain knowledge, which is our contribution. For positive pair sets, lambda plus, we sample an image from partition S of volume R and construct the pairs in the positive set by using the two augmented versions of an image as well as the original one. For the negative pairs that lambda, plus, lambda minus, we consider images from only other partitions and prevent them contrasting <coughs> uh, from similar partitions of any volume. 
For example, if the positive pair is selected from partition one, the images from the remaining partitions will construct the uh, negative pairs as shown by the like, red arrows here. In the second strategy we propose, which we denote by G superscript of D, now we also carefully select positive pairs along with the negative pairs as done in the previous strategy. For positive pairs, we match the images from the corresponding par partitions across volumes. This is shown by green arrows when a positive image is from partition one. Uh, with the proposed global training strategy, we can model uh, more complex similarity cues compared to the uh, random transformations. So in our architecture, to capture the global features, we have an encoder E and a small network G1. During optimization, we enforce the global, represent, global contrastive losses on the representations after G1, which we denote as Z. And after the optimization, using the proposed uh, training strategies, we, we aim to have a cluster per partition in the representation, in the representation phase, as shown in the figure uh, on the right. And after training this encoder and the G1, we disregard G1, we throw it out, and use the representation after encoder for the upcoming steps. As it, because it has been shown in the literature that the representation of encoder, representation after E, is more useful for the downstream task compared to the representation after G1. The, this is probably because the representation after G1, which is Z, is uh, maybe too specific for the contrast loss, and we we need something more relaxed for the uh, downstream task. So here we pre-trained the encoder with the proposed global strategy. Now we capture we can capture good global level representations that are useful for downstream tasks. Furthermore, we also hypothesize that pixel-wise prediction tasks like segmentation can further benefit from learning distinctive local level representations within an image to distinguish between neighboring regions. And this can be complementary to the global representations that we propose. So for that purpose, we define a local loss as an extension of the contrastive loss and train a decoder with this loss added on top of the pre-trained encoder, which is kept basically frozen. So here we also define two strategies for uh, local contra uh, contrasting uh, to, to capture the local features. In the first strategy, which we denote as G superscript R, we apply a pair of random intense transformations on an image to get X tilde and X set and match the corresponding local regions within the feature maps f tilde f hat which we show by the like uh, yellow regions we match them as similar and these regions uh, should be dissimilar to the neighboring regions shown by like different colors here in this strategy we do not use any domain knowledge uh, and also note that we match local level representations here instead of image level representations. We construct uh, near positive and negative sets accordingly, and where we denote the positive set uh, by omega plus, and where u and v denotes the index of the selected local region, and we denote the negative pair set as omega by omega minus, where u prime and v prime denotes the in indexes of the uh, remaining local regions. And after optimization, we aim to get lower dimensional representations similar to the one shown in the figure uh, on the left, oh, the right, sorry. So in the second strategy for capture to capture the uh, local features, unlike L superscript R, unlike the random strategy, uh, we denote this second strategy by L superscript D, where we 
leverage domain knowledge and assume that the volumes are roughly aligned. And similar to the global loss, we sample corresponding images across two different volumes, I and J, and obtain feature maps Fi and Fj. And we match the corresponding local regions as positive. And like before, the positive and negative sets are constructed using the indexes u v and u prime v prime within the feature map. So to go into a bit more mathematical representation from the previous notations, we define the local loss for a positive pair as shown in the equation here. And compared to the global loss equation, the change here is that we replace the, the whole image level representation Z by a local level representations F of U and V. And the total loss of batch is given by summation over all positive pairs uh, for each chosen pair of images. So to summarize, we propose training strategies to capture both global and local features. And we evaluate these pre-training strategies on three data sets. Also, we investigate if the proposed pre-training strategies is complementary to the existing semi-supervised and data augmentation uh, methods. Uh, we performed experiments on three MRI data sets called ACDC, prostate, and MM. WHS. These data sets contain different number of segmented uh, number of structures to segment as shown in the figures. And for experiments, we use the pre-trained weights obtained from both proposed strategies as initialization and fine-tune the segmentation task with limited annot uh, annotations. And we compare these results with the relevant methods in the literature that I described in the beginning of the talk. Uh, here we split each data set into disjoint pre-training and test sets. For pre-training, we only use images without their labels. And for fine-tuning, we experimented with different number of volumes of one, two, and eight to evaluate, uh, limit, uh, evaluate different like limited annotation settings. The, Throughout all the experiments, the validation set is fixed to two volumes. And we run each experiment six times to ensure that uh, it does not depend on initialization. And we report the mean dice score over all images and over all runs for every method. So for discussion, I first show results on one data set called ACDC for limited annotation setting of uh, two labeled volumes. Here we see that both proposed global strategies yield higher gains than the random transformations denoted by G superscript R and the baseline. And the here baseline is basically initializing the whole network randomly and training the whole architecture uh, using limited labeled data, set, which like gives the low accuracy here. So these results illustrate. These results uh, illustrate that, that the importance of illustrates the importance of careful selection of positive and negative pairs. So, out of these two training strategies, G superscript D performs better. This is because for positive pairs, we match images across volumes that leverages uh, naturally occurring clusters uh, across subjects, and as a result, we may model more complex similarity queues. In the next experiment, we fix the pre-trained encoder GR and evaluate the two proposed local loss strategies on top of it. So we observe that LR, where we contrast the local regions of intense transformed images, performs better. And we understand that here, uh, uh, there is the only rough alignment between the volumes exist, and perfect spatial alignment may not exist. Therefore, in LD, uh, match corresponding local regions across two different volumes may not contain 
similar structures within them, and this might adversely affect the learning and subsequently uh, can lead to lower accuracy. And when we combine the best pre-training strategies of global and local loss, we get an additional boost in the performance. And these results hold uh, on the remaining two datasets as well. Uh, for comparison, we compare with pre-text test uh, pre-training methods called rotation, in painting, and uh, context restriction. Also, uh, with semi-supervised and data augmentation method. Here, we observe that the proposed contrasting strategies yield better performance than all the other methods that we compare. And this also holds for all like, three data sets. Furthermore, with our evaluations, we also observed that uh, the proposed training, the proposed pre-training strategies is complementary to the semi-supervised and data augmentation methods. Here we evaluate self-training and mix-up. When we combine it, then when we combine them with the proposed strategy, it yields further boost in accuracy. For example, in the two labeled volume setting, Combining proposed initialization with a simple augmentation mix-up improve the performance and close the gap with the upper bound to less than like a 0.1 dice score. And here the upper bound is the setting where we use all the available uh, annotated images, which is the like most ideal case. Uh, to conclude, Using domain knowledge in pre-training yielded higher performance gains, and local extension of contrastive laws was found to be useful for segmentation tests. And proposed pre-training strategies is complementary to semi-supervised and data augmentation methods, and combining them yielded further gains, and we basically close the gap with the upper bounds by using only uh, two annotated volumes. So for more results, please refer to the article, article, and we have the code available on GitHub if you want to give it a try. And thank you for your attention, and please like show it if you have any questions. Um, great talk. Uh, yeah. Thank you. Great talk, Gerson. Thank you. Uh, it was very, very nice, actually. There is there's already one uh, question. I'm, that's why I'm, I'm continuing in English. The, the question is in English. Uh, it comes from uh, Love the uh, We both right. love her, actually. Uh, she's also a, uh, um, yes. a very uh, potent um, researcher in this field. She asks, uh, how would it be if the CT images have cancer? So that's one question. So when there is pathology, how would the system perform? Mm -hmm. uh, I guess... You can you can open this question up by considering pathological samples in the training set and also in the test set and mm -hmm. or in the test set. So, so the task is segmenting that pathology basically, right? So we have I the annotations for that so. pathology. I guess um, so. She she didn't. Yeah, like I mean we that. That would be definitely interesting, I think. Mm -hmm. um, the thing is, such pathologies are like quite small compared to the whole images. I think, mm -hmm. I mean, in the limited annotation setting, this would help to some extent, uh, but we haven't experimented with such data sets and I cannot foresee how much we, we, we can gain uh, by using this particular approach in the semi-supervised setting. But uh, I can confidently say that this the results will be better than the baseline, definitely, mm. where we have where we train the whole network using just uh, just just one or two volumes. Mm -hmm. Great. She has another question, a second question. Mm -hmm. Can she, she asks? Can this idea work on blood vessel segmentation of eye images? I guess it's uh, retina segmentation and related, well, 
or the, the, the related segmentation problems in, in such images. Um, so mm -hmm. I'm not sure if, if she's if we are now considering 2D images or 3D images, uh, but probably 2D. So question is, yes. can this idea work on uh, the segmentation uh, of our images? I'm not quite familiar with those retinal images. If they mm -hmm. are 3D, uh, we can basically explore these pre-training strategies by using basically the same information that we use mm -hmm. in this paper. If it is if it is two D, then we don't have this domain knowledge, so mm -hmm. we cannot incorporate it into the process. But then I think the best thing that we can do would be applying this uh, uh, random strategy mm -hmm. because we don't have if if we don't have like similarity queue between different volumes, we can basically apply different transformations to a 2D image and say that, mm -hmm. okay, this, this will have like uh, similar representations in the latent space. And that representation will be different from the remaining uh, retinal images in the batch. Mm -hmm. mm. So she, she, she had a signal be, on, yeah. Uh, she she also uh, clarified that the, the those were retina segmentation and the, the images were two D. Uh, regarding mm -hmm. her first question, she, uh, she explained that she wants to be able to understand if there is cancer while you while she while you already have a few data, just a few examples with cancer. The rest is just normal, uh, healthy let's say, CT images. So, mm -hmm. yeah, rare examples, let's say. So. I see. Uh, mm -hmm. So, yeah, basically what we can explore, I think, pre-training with the healthy images and a kind mm -hmm. of fine-tuning with the one that has cancer in it, uh, still, I believe this could bring some improvement, mm -hmm. but uh, I cannot foresee how much improvement that we can get. This is something, this is like an empirical question. Mm -hmm. yeah. But I, I, I, I guess it, it will lead to some improvement. Because basically, mm -hmm. from the health images, the network is it's supposed to learn some, supposed to capture some global information, for example, for brain images, what the brain image looks like, let, let me say. Mm -hmm. And for the decoder parts, then we now have a smaller network and we, we may not need uh, a very large training set to train that small part. Mm. So that could help to some extent, I think, yeah. I also have um, a few questions, actually. One question is, so okay. you, um, so you're working with limited annotated data, uh, but mm -hmm. obviously the, the, the answer to, to this following question is empirical, probably it depends mm -hmm. on the problem, but what is the lower bound about the uh, about the number of annotated data that you your algorithm needs. So when we talk about limited amount of annotated data, what kind of numbers are we talking about? Uh, here, for example, in the experiments that I presented here, uh, so we only use two labeled volumes, mm -hmm. which is quite low, actually. Yeah, and uh, yeah. the improvement compared to the baseline is over like ten percent, which I believe this is quite good. significant. Yeah. yeah, and if we if we when we incorporate more labeled volumes along with the uh, unlabeled data, we can get further boost. And I think we had mm -hmm. such results in the paper because we mm -hmm. experimented with the volumes of uh, basically one, two, and 
eight in, in the paper. Um, and uh, by the way, uh, Lavdi, th uh, thanks. Uh, for that. Uh, thank we can close. Oops, sorry, there was a delay. I'm sorry about the, the interruption. Um, um, yeah, uh, lovely. Ours, it says uh, thanks for, for the answers. Um, <clears throat> another, sorry, than, <laughs> another, then another question is about the the hardware requirement for, for to, to to run your algorithm. So so you say that okay. So when we talk about medical images, we talk about three dimensional data. Mm -hmm. Yeah. One question is. Actually, you showed examples on three different data sets. One was on prostate mm -hmm. MR, so which is, I believe, in 3D. Mm -hmm. two, the other two were cardiac MR. Normally, cardiac MR mm -hmm. uh, data are 3D plus yeah. time. So it's typically covering the, the, the, um, the dynamics of heart as well. But cardiac in your... Cycle. Yeah, cardiac cycle. Mm -hmm. uh, in your examples, did you use this 3D plus time in or temporal information, or is just static three-dimensional images? Uh, now here the images are 3D, but the thing uh -huh. is our network is 2D. We just sample images. We just sample mm -hmm. slices from 3D images by using mm -hmm. the information that uh, 3D slices are roughly aligned. Mm -hmm. But the network itself is 2D, so mm -hmm. therefore it requires much lower GPU memory, and yeah. which is like that was my, my next question actually. What what what, what compared to what kind of the whole like 3D world? Yeah. Mm -hmm. What kind of uh, hardware uh, requirements does your does your approach uh, have? So. So you say that you're you shared you sh you shared the code so we can go in and run uh, uh, that, that code from GitHub. Uh, but then, uh, what kind of hardware do we need to to train and to test um, our data, let's mm -hmm. say, with your approach? Mm -hmm. um, for training, I think we uh, we use. So like mid-level GPU from NVIDIA, which has, I think, around 12 gigabytes of memory. Mm -hmm. So it is not a very like specialized like GPU in the market. Mm -hmm. So I would say we, we don't need a very expensive ones, of course, uh, for to train this uh, algorithm. Uh, but this is, of course, with the advantage of running the, all this stuff on 2D. If we can, if you want to move to the 3D, then we will, of course, need maybe multiple GPUs and GPUs with like higher memory. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. It was yeah. It was very very nice talk. Uh, thank you. Um, Ben ben şey Türkçe'ye de döneyim <gülüyor> dinleyicilerimiz tamam, bir kısmı için belki ee, şey gerçekten hoş bir e, çalışmaydı özellikle şey e, yani e, to be görüntülerde bir kere işaretli görüntü bulmak hakikaten zor yani e, bunu e, sen benden daha iyi biliyorsun e, şey e, doktorların zamanı yok ama onların işaretlemesi Aslında. lazım dolayısıyla işaretli veri sıkıntısı var. Artı evet. bir de tabi e, to be görüntüler genellikle böyle üç boyutlu hatta üç, üçten fazla boyutu olan işte o dediğim gibi hani kardiyak cycle'dan da e, kardiyak cycle'ın farklı anlarından da görüntü alıyorsan 3D plus time yani e, dört boyutlu belki hani evet. öyle düşünebiliriz e, veriler. Dolayısıyla bunları e, bilgisayarın kullanacağın e, bilgisayarın hafızasına e, sığdırmak ve onların üzerinde kod koşturmak falan oldukça sıkıntılı. Ee, haliyle senin önerdiğin, yani sizin önerdiğiniz bu yöntem aslında her ikisine de e, çare. Yani hem sınırlı bir e, hardware'in e, donanımın varsa 
ona çare çünkü iki boyutta yaklaşıyorsunuz probleme. E, hem de işaretli verin azsa e, onu da bir şekilde hallediyorsunuz. Oldukça güzel e, bir evet, kesinlikle. çalışma. <gülüyor> evet. E, Kesinlikle evet. Yani bu işaretleme ile ilgili bir problem de tabii şey e, klinikten kliniğe ya da scanner'dan scanner'a bu görüntülerin e, özellikleri çok değişiyor ve biz bir klinikten bir data alıp onu annotate edip hmm. işte işaretleyip bir network, başarılı bir network train edebiliriz, eğitebiliriz. Ama bu hmm. çare değil çünkü başka bir klinikte bu yöntem çalışmayacak ya da e, o klinik, o scanner'ı Scanner device'ını değiştirdiği zaman yeni gelen scanner device'ta çalışmayacak ya da hatta o scanner device'ın parametreleri değiştiğinde çalışmayacak gibi problemler var. O işaretleme yapmak, annotation yapmak tabii ki şey değil, e, makul bir çözüm değil. Evet. Ha, belki bir soru da şey olabilir. E, e, şimdi normalde şeyde... E, Tıbbi görüntülerde e, bu standartizasyon da bir problemdir ya. Yani yani e, sen de dedin işte multi center yani çok farklı merkezli çalışmalar varsa yani işte X hastanesinden bir grupta ta aldın, sonra Y hastanesinden başka bir grupta ta aldın ama aralarında örneğin e, kesit kalınlığı farklı. E, dolayısıyla o resimlerin aslında standart bir düzleme çekilmesi. E, lazım. Standartizasyon e, da lazım. E, sizin önerdiğiniz yöntemde bu standartizasyonun e, daha önceden yapılmış olduğu mu varsayılıyor yoksa şey mi? E, görüntülerdeki işte e, kesit kalınlığı ve işte çözünürlük gibi e, varyasyonların e, fazla olması e, da sıkıntı yaratıyor mu? Ee, ses kesildi, bağlantı kesildi sanırım. Son kısmını duyamadım söylediğinizin. Ha, pardon. Ee, şey ise yani demek istediğim e, tıbbi görüntülerde farklı merkezlerden aldığın görüntülerde de şey olabiliyor. Çözünürlük farklı olabiliyor. Çözünürlük farkları olduğu zaman da önerdiğiniz yöntem çalışır mı yoksa öncesinde bir standartizasyon mu gerekir görüntülere? Evet, öncesinde bir standartizasyon gerekecektir. Hı hı. Çünkü yani bu durumda tabi yani önerdiğimiz yöntemin o cross scanner robustness diyeyim ona karşı bir hı hı. şeyi yok, koruma mekanizması yok. Bu sadece az sayıda datadan nasıl öğreniriz diye cevaplıyor. Hı hı. Farklı hı hı. bir klinik bir data geldiğinde tabi bu kadar iyi çalışmayacak bir yöntem. O zaman hmm. şeyi düşünmek lazım. Bu gelen datayı nasıl bu network'e göre adapt edebilirim? Hmm. Ki e, bu network o data da iyi çalışsın. Evet. Ee, şey e, başka soru yok galiba e, Ertuğrul'cum. Çok güzel bir sunumlu hakikaten. Ee, bazı dinleyicilerimiz için matematiksel olarak birazcık ağır gelmiş olabilir e, sunum. Ama e, ilginç e, fikirler ve e, içeriyor ve şey çok da faydalı. Özellikle hakikaten e, alanı genişletecek, alandaki çalışmaları genişletecek bir, e, bir çalışma sunduğun bence. E, teşekkür ediyoruz. Katıldığın için, zaman ayırdığın için ve bu bilgileri, bu çalışmaları bizimle paylaştığın için. Ben teşekkür ederim. Ee, tamam, yani e, burada isterseniz noktalayabiliriz. E, son söylemek istediğin bir şey var mı Ertem? En son söylemek istediğin yoksa yani yayını sonlandırabiliriz. Yok, çok teşekkürler davet ettiğiniz için hocam. Umarım tekrar ben, görüşürüz. Evet, inşallah görüşürüz. Ben teşekkür ederim. Evet, evet. E, bu e, ikinci seminerimizdi. E, Ayda Uygar Merkezimizin ikinci semineri. Konuşmacımız Ertunç Erdil'di. Doktor Ertunç Erdil, e, ETH Zürich'ten, İsviçre'den katıldı. E, teşekkür ediyoruz yeniden Ertunç. E, görüşmek üzere. Görüşürüz abi.